Welcome to today's webinar. County Health Rankings and Roadmaps is a program of the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute. This webinar is brought to you thanks to the contributions of colleagues and partners in Wisconsin and across the nation, with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It is produced in collaboration with Healthy Places by Design, an organization that advances community-led action and proven strategies to ensure health and well-being for all. The University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Dejo since time immemorial. UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. This webinar will be recorded. All speakers' views are their own. Guest bios and slides from today's webinar are available on our resource page. We will share a link to the resource page when the webinar begins. Stay up to date on all things CHRNR. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, sign up for our newsletter by scanning this QR code with your phone's camera. It's the best way to find out about upcoming webinars, our podcast, and our latest tools and resources. Your facilitators today include our host, Erica Burroughs Girardi, with support from CHRNR communication specialist, Colleen Wick, and the Collaborative Learning Director from Healthy Places by Design, Joanne Lee. We invite you to continue the conversation immediately after the webinar in our discussion group. Joanne Lee will be our lead facilitator. And watch for a chat from Colleen for details on how to join the group after the webinar. Hi, and welcome to the connection between the gender pay gap and health. Hi, my name is Erica Burroughs Girardi, and I am so excited for this webinar. I have to tell you, I've learned so much about the gender pay gap that we here at CHRNR have been researching and its influence on health. So I want to tell you why we are shining a light on the gender pay gap. Here at CHRNR, we believe that it is possible for everyone to have what they need, not only to survive, but to thrive. Together, we can shift resources to people and communities who need them the most. We use our collective people power to remedy the scarcity caused by capitalism, reimagine the way we produce what we need to thrive, redistribute and restore resources, and share the abundance of this earth. And the good news is that we have the collective power to right injustices and create equity. So with that, I wanna introduce you to, to the team that's gonna help us dig into today's topic. And I wanna start by introducing you to the newest member of our webinar um, production team, and her name is Colleen Wick. Now, you may not have ever seen Colleen before today, but I will promise you, you do know her because she has been involved in webinar production behind the scenes for years. She's the one that emails you your, our, emails out our newsletter, emails the resource guide, and she's also the person behind our tweets and LinkedIn and Facebook posts because she's our social media manager. So Colleen will be engaging you in the chat today. Welcome, Colleen. Hey, Erica. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Colleen. Some of you may be wondering where Tommy Jaime is, and Tommy has moved on to another position, and we wish him well in his future endeavors. Like Erica said, I will meet you in the chat. Use the chat to share remarks or respond to questions we may ask you. Our chat conversations tend to be very engaging, so if, you, if they're too distracting, you could just simply close out the chat window. If you have any questions for the panelists, use the Q&A box. That is where Joanne Lee with Healthy Places by Design will meet you. Joanne, do you wanna introduce yourself? 
Yes, thanks, Colleen. Hello, Erica, and hello, everybody in the audience today. I'm really excited to be here in today's webinar, and my role will be to manage the Q&A box. So as Colleen mentioned, remember, if you have questions for the panelists, it goes in the Q&A. If you're um, wanting to share about yourself or strategies related to today's topics, go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, I'm really pleased that I'm, I'm going to be joined by um, two folks who will be helping in the answer your questions. And that's Francesca Retre, who is CEO of the YWCA San Antonio, and Dr. Elizabeth Blomberg, who's a research and analytics scientist with CHRNR. And so you'll see all three of our names in the Q&A box, again, making sure we answer as many questions as possible. We'll also have time to answer some questions live. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to introducing our wonderful technologist, Erin Schultz. Thanks, Joanne. It's always great to be here with everyone. Today, if you have any technical issues, such as not being able to hear or see the slides, please use the Q&A box to message us. That allows us to be able to find your message a little bit easier than in the chat. Now I'll turn it over to our wonderful host, Erica. Oh, well, thank you, Erin, and thanks to all of the production team um, for their help in producing this webinar. The gender pay gap is one of those equity topics that you know requires a little bit of level setting so i'm going to ask that you bear with me because i want to give some background information and kind of set the stage before we really get into our discussion this year chrnr introduced a new measure from the american community survey it's called the gender pay gap the gender pay gap measures the difference in pay between the salaries of men and women who work in the united states now, currently, women in general earn about 82 cents for every dollar white male, male makes. The gap is even wider for women of color and those living in rural areas. It's important for me to mention at this point that the American Community Survey captures a binary re representation of gender. So people living with intersectional identities, like for instance, transgender women can experience compounding effects. But I wanna be clear that when you hear us use the term gender today, we are using that binary classification that the American Community Survey uses. And you can see what the gender pay gap is for your county by checking out your county snapshot. The gender pay gap is listed as an additional measure in the social and economic bucket. Have you ever thought about what's behind the gender pay gap? Like, I mean, why do women get paid less for the same work? It is very complicated, but the short answer is the value that we place on work that is perceived to be suitable, suitable for women lies at the heart of the gender pay gap. So what are those roles that we have de deemed suitable for women? They tend to be nurturing roles like child care providers or teachers, you know, educators, nursing assistants. And this bias is so strong that we see the pay of an entire industry or an entire sector shift based on gender. During World War II, for example, women played major roles in the new field at the time of computing. In fact, the field was dominated by women because men were off to war. But once men came back and began taking a foothold in the computer industry, women disappeared and the pay increased. To this day, we still see computer science dominated by men. And you all probably remember from your history books that women filled a lot of manufacturing jobs during World War II. But when men came back, women were pretty much expelled from those jobs and again, we saw those wages be really, really nice for men when they came back from the war. And get this, we even see salaries in some sectors shift in the opposite direction. Let's look at um, parks and recreation, for example. After women start occupying jobs in this sector, the pay of parks and recreation jobs just kind of went down. And lastly, we see that women in female-dominated professions like nursing, well, in those dominant female-dominated professions, men are still getting paid more. And this inequity has a number of devastating effects. 
The research is clear on this. There's a link between the gender pay gap and worsened physical and mental health among women. Women can suffer from stress and anxiety because they're not getting paid what they deserve. We'll talk more about this later in the webinar. The gap also contributes to poverty among women and children. When, men, when women are paid less, they struggle to make healthy choices like buying healthier food, living in safe, secure housing, or affording childcare, let alone preventive care. The gender pay gap affects everyone, not just women, because women are earning less. And when women earn less, they have less buying power, which means that there's less money being poured into the economy. And this slows economic growth, which affects all of us. We can close this gap, folks. I know everyone looks for the quick fix, but there really isn't a quick fix for a practice that is centuries old and has no singular cause. However, there are steps that can be taken at the federal, state, and organizational levels. And I've selected three policy solutions to highlight. Know that there's a lot more though, and you can actually find out more by going to our website. But at the federal level, Policies that would guarantee paid family and maternity leave is a start. Women tend to be the primary caregivers. So when children get sick or elderly parents need transportation to medical appointments, most likely it's mom who's taking time away from work. And if she isn't paid for that time, she loses income. And some of you ladies know that you've had to save your annual leave or your sick leave so that when it was time for you to welcome your new baby home, you had enough time to recover. So I know that we've heard all the, the, the age old argument that guaranteeing paid leave would cost businesses too much. I mean, we simply can't afford it. Well, let's see how many other countries have made paid sick leave for workers a priority. Take a look at this map. The orange counties that you, not counties, the orange countries that you see here are the ones without guaranteed paid sick leave. Notice there's a country that's notable that's orange there, and that's the US. Yes, according to the World Policy Analysis Center, which tracks health policies globally, the US is the only industrial country without paid sick leave. China, Russia and other countries that you see shaded in green offer at least six months. Now we do have the FMLA, like the Family Medical Leave Act that does guarantee that you won't lose your job if you apply for that um, and you are, you know, you're approved to get it. So it will extend your family leave, but there's no guarantee that you'll get paid. In most cases you won't get paid. So that's not really helpful. By the way, a link to this policy map will be included in your resource guide that you'll get tomorrow. So that way you can take a look at some of the other policies and see where the US stacks up when it comes to health policies globally. All right, let's take a quick look at two other policies because I know you're anxious to hear from our guests and I am too. Another policy that works is to stop basing employee pay on salary history. Now I've placed this solution in the state level bucket, because this is a practice that we see commonly among state government jobs. However, this policy solution can be applied to any sector. And then lastly, at the organizational level, consider a pay audit to identify and fix disparities. You know, my sister works for a major US bank, which recently conducted an audit in their effort to address the, gen the gender pay gap. She learned that apparently she had been vastly underpaid compared to her colleagues because she received a special pay increase. It wasn't like a merit increase. It was actually called a parity increase to correct the disparity. So I'm curious if there are strategies that you know of are being used to address the gender pay gap where you live. So feel free to share those with Colleen in the chat because I wanna check them out later. Now, during our discussion with our expert panel today, we will learn more about the gender pay gap and how to respond. So here are a few questions that we'll explore as we dig into this um, gender pay gap discussion. Well, why does the gender pay gap still persist? I mean, even in 2020, the gap still exists. Aren't there laws to address unequal pay? Well, we'll talk about that. How did the pandemic affect the gap? 
Were there benefits or did the pandemic simply exacerbate this inequity? And of course, as advocates of better health and equity, closing the gender pay gap is of interest to us, but how do we encourage others to be just as interested? Like, how do we message the need to close the gap? Well, we're gonna hear from our guests about one thing that they're doing that's helping the, to encourage people to close this gap. So uh, now, to help us think about these questions, join me in welcoming our guests, both of whom are with the YWCA San Antonio. Misty Hardy is the Director of Racial Justice and Gender Equity, and Corinne Reyes is the Director of Health Equity there in, uh, at the YWCA. So Misty and Corinne, welcome, how are you? Hi, it's a pleasure to join everybody. Welcome, thank you for having us today. And thank you for being here. Now, I also want to mention that San Antonio is a 2018 RWJF Culture of Health Prize winner. So these, this prize honors and elevates communities in America working at the forefront to advance health, opportunity, and equity at, for all. So um, our post-webinar discussion is the place that you're going to be after this webinar, because we're going to unpack what you're going to hear today. Please plan to come join the discussion with us. During the video intro, you heard about the discussion groups that follow our webinars. They're facilitated by our friend Joanne Lee, and they're always very engaging, giving you the opportunity to share and learn from others. So definitely join us right afterward. And Colleen is going to chat out information at the end of the webinar, so you can um, use that link to join join the discussion group. And Misty and Corinne are going to be there too. So Misty, I want to start with you. I've done enough talking. So now it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me what is the primary reason behind the gender pay gap? Well, that's an excellent question. And the first thing I'd like to do is clarify, because most often when people think about the wage gap and as it relates to gender, they always equate it with a lack of education. So women must be undereducated comparatively with their male counterparts and that's why they're getting paid less. The reality is the wage gap is not about women not having the same level of education. What's important to note is that in fact, in San Antonio alone, women tend to be more educated than men and still earn less. And I'm talking about jobs that require advanced educational degrees, the sciences and higher education. The wage gap actually widens in those professions. So this isn't about a lack of education. What we're looking at is professions that are populated primarily by women are often undervalued. You mentioned this earlier. We're talking about childcare providers, teachers, administrative uh, specialists, hospitality specialists. The sad part about it is that even in these female dominated professions, men still tend to hold leadership or administrative roles or specialty roles, which sustains the pay gap. There's a tradition uh, I think most people are aware of uh, in our society of girls kind of being steered from topics of studies like math and the scientists, uh, I'm sorry, the sciences that would lead them to higher paying professions. Um, but when you take into consideration the women that are in these professions who happen to, you know, sneak in and get in in, in, a, in a minority um, representation, they are still paid less than their male counterparts. What you're seeing play out there is what we like to refer to and what is refer commonly referred to as occupational sorting. This idea of occupational sorting happened when women started joining the office spaces and joining men in the office. And because of their sexuality, it was deemed that they were too much of a distraction and couldn't be in the same places and spaces as professional men. And so then that contributed to the pay gap, sustaining the pay gap. Um, and, and what it does is it's weaponizing, you know, or, or being uh, punitive toward women for just yeah. being women. Yeah, and you know, I appreciate the fact that you named it, uh, named that education right at the top. You know, that narrative that oh, well, they're getting paid less because they're not as educated. So thank you for for helping us begin to explore like 
what's really at it is it's the value that we're placing yes. on those on those jobs. Um, I, I have another question for you because I know that there are multiple dimensions to the gender pay gap that we should be considering. For, for example, how do we see the gender pay gap differ from women of for women of color? Okay, great question. So when you look at women and men as a whole, you disregard race. We're looking at the fact that the wage gap between a white non-Hispanic male and a woman in general is about 80%. But when you consider race and you look at it, you're looking at black women making 63% mm -hmm. and Latino women, Latinas making 55.4% to every dollar that a man is making. And the reason behind this is because work that was historically performed by enslaved women, right? Care work, like we said before, child care, elder care, teaching, domestic work, all of those have always been viewed as free work and undervalued. And so because they're undervalued, they don't take into consideration the physical and mental effort required to sustain these positions and these occupations. So because they're undervalued, they're going to be underpaid. Because of their roots in slavery, they're looked as, as free work, as, as menial work. And so then when you take into consideration race and you look and see who's occupying those positions, the disparity is even greater. Yeah. So this has, this is so much tied just into our history. Um, mm -hmm. um, of this country and what they, again, what they consider to be a profession or a job for mm -hmm. a person of color, as opposed to a job for, for a person that is white. So, and it goes back to what I was saying about how complex this is. So mm -hmm. um, keep in mind folks that, you know, the solutions to closing the gender gap pay gap will be multifaceted because there's so many reasons why we got to the place that we're in. Um, I wanted you to tell us a little bit about what we see happening here because this lifetime loss of income is stunning. This, when you just look at the sheer numbers that by underpaying women, let's just say African-Americans and Latinas, when you look at how much money is being lost or that they're losing out on or that they're never going to see, and you correlate that with poverty, mm. you see that not only, not only is this impacting families of color disproportionately, it's impacting families, I mean, uh, communities of color disproportionately, right? Yeah. So over a lifetime, if a woman, if an African-American woman or a Latina were paid what they were actually due, they wouldn't be in poverty. No, we're talking about almost a million dollars. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, and I want to stay on this topic mm -hmm. about poverty because we know that this gap leads to an increase of it. So let's explore that a little bit more. Okay, so when we think about the wage gap in, in conjunction with poverty, right? You, you, you asked about poverty earlier. And so as we're looking at lost wages, if women were paid equitably, we're talking about bringing in $18.2 billion into San Antonio alone. What's happening is women tend to be most often head of household. They're already getting paid less. And so when they're the sole provider of that household income, you look at the fact that they're paid less. Now the household in general is being hit, I mean, uh, astronomically, right? Yeah. You're talking about rents. You got you to gotta decide if I'm going to pay rent. Uh, a mortgage, if you're able to afford buying a home, right? You're talking about childcare. You're working to pay childcare to work to pay childcare. If you're lucky enough to have transportation, all of these things are negatively impacted by the wage gap. Basic needs are hard enough to afford on two incomes. 
We're mm-hmm. fastly approaching a recession here, right? And so we're looking at people that are struggling in two household incomes. When you have a single household income and that head of household isn't earning her full potential based solely on gender, that's a huge, huge inequity. Yeah, yeah. And um, we're going to talk about the wage equity awareness campaign that you all is do- are doing, but you did it with the United Way of San Antonio. And I want to talk about this finding first, and then we'll get into what um, about the wage campaign, because in this finding, you, you, you found that there was that, like, that direct link between poverty and women who are head of household, and you were just talking about that. And a lot of these head of household, um, when they're head of household like that, they're most likely a single parent. Mm -hmm. And I've heard the argument that if a woman chooses to be a single parent, that's not my fault. I mean, why should I care if a woman makes a decision to be a single parent? And I just want to, I'm playing, I know I'm playing devil's advocate, Mm -hmm. but because I've heard it, I'm willing to bet that people in our audience have heard it as well. How do we respond when we hear something like that? Well, I I would agree with you and bet a lot of people have heard that argument. Um, That argument is a is a time honored tactic and it's a deflection from the true issue. The fact of the matter is it does not matter. The issue isn't whether women decide to parent or not. That's not that that's that has zero to do with the fact that regardless of if she's a parent or chooses not to parent, she is not paid the same. In San Antonio alone, more than 55% of the households in poverty are led by single women, right? When you're looking at that and you add that pool of women to women in general that aren't being paid their worth, we can say that this has zero to do with her parenting, her choosing to be a parent, and it has to do with providing arguments to discriminate against women deciding to parent or not, and then uh, putting a value saying whether they're deserving or not based on those choices. Mm. I appreciate you. I appreciate you for saying that because, um, you know, that's a deflection argument. And um, I don't, it's so easy to get caught up in that mm-hmm. tr- when, 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 the argument is made and, 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 and they try to put a, a moral slant on it. But the mm-hmm. reality is, is whether a woman is a parent or not a parent, the problem is she's not getting paid the same or not getting paid her worth. Exactly. And so let's, exactly. let's, let's, let's be clear about what the <laughs> real issue is always. Yes. <laughs> all right. So tell us a little bit more about the wage equity campaign that you all created to to message the need to close the gap. Okay, so the unique thing about our uh, our campaign is that in uh, 2019, uh, just before the pandemic hit, um, you know, the YWCA has made the wage gap a priority ever since women worked, I mean, entered the workforce, right? It has been a focal point of the YWCA. However, in 2019, we were fortunate enough to have our local United Way support and share our concerns for the working women in San Antonio. And they put out a request for proposals uh, to local area nonprofits and our proposal was accepted. Our first social media messages and imaging, um, the focus was to bring about awareness while simultaneously minimizing the negative, I'm sorry, rhetoric that's associated with addressing gender-based inequities. And what I mean by that is when we first wrote out this uh, PSA, just mentioning women and the topic of women being paid less was triggering. It had very polarizing responses and, and very negative responses. And it was almost as if that message could not be received. So what we did was we kind of recalibrated and the decision was made. Why don't we use a good old Texan male voice um, uh, to do a voiceover, right? This uh, PSA ran during the Summer Olympics and it, it was it was so well received. And, and what that showed and what that proved uh, is that not only is there a need for awareness, right? Because there's a lot of people that that aren't even aware of the pay gap, 
how it yeah. negatively impacts them, how it negatively impacts them if they're a woman, how it negatively impacts them if they're a woman of color, and then how yeah. it negatively impacts their own community, regardless of gender. But what it also did was it reinforced the need for male allyship mm, around yes. this particular topic. And we could talk all day long about the, you know, it being right, wrong, or indifferent. But the fact is, we do need male allyship to yeah. join us in addressing uh, wage disparities, this, this wage gap. In yeah. San Antonio, what we did was we continued our efforts, not only with that PSA, but uh -huh. we created a business cohort. And uh, anybody that's interested in either starting a cohort or needing support for a cohort, I, I, I encourage you to send me an email. I'll be happy to support you. What we did was we invited local business owners and employers to join us in the effort to um raise community awareness, and take intentional steps on learning why it's important and learning how they can ensure that women in San in the San Antonio area are paid equitably. So, oh, um, oh cool. Yeah, well, I want to talk a little bit more about the business cohort in just a second, but now mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to ask Erin, um, she actually has the PSA, guys, <laughs> so she's going to queue it up so you can see this, this PSA that um, Misty's been talking about. So Erin, go ahead and play that for us. Howdy, I was a small business owner in the greater San Antonio area for over 20 years. In Texas, we are proud of and we value family. Texas women are our wives, mothers, sisters, daughters, and nieces. Texas women are tough and nobody works harder. They deserve to be paid the same. It's just what's right and fair. So don't mess with our families, our women, or Texas. Visit ywcasa.org to find out more. Pretty cool. <laughs> was he Texan he, enough for you? He was. He was. <laughs> he was like, that really did sound like, okay. There's this great TV show now on called Monarch, and he kind of reminded me of that. It's <laughs> a good TV show, I tell you. But anyway, all right, so here's some pictures of your social media post, and tell us a little bit. I know you said it was well-received, but yes. tell us a little bit more about the business cohort and, and what's the next step, basically, after, you know, how are you moving forward with your message campaign? Okay, so the next step is, like I said before, we... You know, I have had an opportunity to work with some amazing, amazing people in San Antonio who do care about the wage gap, who care about women being paid their worth and, and closing that wage gap because it's the right thing to do. Um, and so I, I've worked with some wonderful community leaders who are at the table and they're looking both internally and externally at how we can make a difference, how we can be number one, more transparent with, with the wages and salaries being paid and offered, right? That we can take a look internally and make sure that, um, you know, is there an annual overhaul that needs to be done as we're looking at salaries and we're making sure that when women come in, they're being paid equitably, you know, or that women, as you mentioned with your sister earlier, be working in a capacity and not having been paid your worth and those parities get, you know, get paid out and you're starting to level those playing fields. Right. Because at the end of the day, and this is a point that I'd really like to, to highlight, at the end of the day, this isn't just a women's or a woman's issue, although it impacts all of us. This is not just a woman issue. This is an all of us issue. OK, this is this directly uh, impacts how our community, the revenue potential that we have. This is a policy issue. This is a grassroots issue. This is an individual person issue. You looked at the sheer amount of money that based on a woman's gender and race, she's not getting. Yeah, You know, and so this should pull at every heartstring that you have. This should at some point make you say, I want to be a part of this. This is about awareness. This is about equipping. And this is about, you know, staying 10 toes down to make sure that everybody is paid their worth, regardless. Thank you so much, Misty. Okay, so I have goosebumps right now. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you. Hang on, because I'm sure we're going to circle back to you uh, with, with questions. But thank you for getting us started in this discussion. And one of the things that really um, is playing out in everyone's mind is what happened with the pandemic? How did the pandemic 
affect this inequity because we've seen it affect so many others. So Corinne, I wanna um, ask you to come to the mic again. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you, how did the COVID-19 pandemic worsen the gender pay gap? Well, the pandemic actually amplified a lot of the caretaker responsibilities that women were taking on. Um, as we kind of already touched on, in a two-parent household, women still take on over 60% of the responsibility of taking care of children. That's even when there's two parents present. But they're also the caretakers for any ill or infirm family members. So that's basically your COVID patient, right? Wow. So when grandma gets sick, mom's gonna take care of them as you've already said. The typical caretaker for an elderly or infirm family member is a 49 year old female who's providing 20 or more hours of care per week in addition to working full time and providing other responsibilities in the home. So, that's a heavy load to, to lift. So in order to do that, they tend to go for the flexible jobs. Flexible jobs pay less typically, right? So they're even though they're just as educated as men, or if not more, as we've already said, they're gonna take the lower paying job to get that flexibility to take care of home. In addition, during the pandemic, when there was a heavy caretaking load, daycares are out of service, grandma's right. sick, they left the workforce. And they left the workforce at twice the rate of their male counterparts. So, I mean, already that's a, a huge lift when they come back in the workforce, they're not going to get paid as much because they've messed up their work history with that. Now, yeah. to even add an extra layer, because y'all talked about the occupational sorting earlier. So I just wanted to kind of bring that back because professional caretakers are typically women, right? They're your nurses, your CNAs, mm -hmm. your home health aides. So policies for how those people are paid are based on Medicare reimbursement rates. So it's all based on federal policy making. So those roles can pay as little as $10 per hour. And those are very stressful roles to take yeah. on. So can you imagine taking care of somebody professionally all day at work, making barely $10 an hour, then going home and doing the same thing? That's, wow. that's the role of a professional caretaker that is typically a woman. So. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, and you're right about... The, the time of work, some women, um, I, I were, I've known women who actually had to quit working because they didn't have childcare. Um, and so, um, but thank you for letting us know, well, at least pointing out the specifics yeah. because um, I, I think we all had a semblance that, that COVID wasn't really good. <laughs> for, <Yeah. laughs> wasn't really good to women, but this, yeah. this proves it because you've got the numbers behind it to, to mm -hmm. show us. I want to bring it back to health. You're the health equity coordinator there yeah. at YWCA. How does the gender pay gap affect the women's health? And, and let's also talk about mental health too. Yeah, for sure. Um, so to kind of like bring into reality what that pay gap equals, that pay gap equals about 22 months of healthy food for a family or nine months of employer-sponsored health insurance on, a, on an annual basis. So if they just close the gap, they would literally be able to feed their family for two years healthy, good, nutritious food. So that's, it, it's a big deal. And as you can imagine, all this takes a toll on you mentally, the anxiety, the depression, not just the isolation of being a caretaker, but also just all the heaviness of that. So you're going to be six times more likely to experience anxiety or depression. You're also going to be more prone to chronic conditions. One third of caretakers are already sick themselves. They already have some kind of hypertension or diabetes, but they're just not taking care of it. Providing just seven extra hours of caregiving per week puts you at twice the risk of coronary heart disease. You're also more likely to experience hypertension, poor wound healing, lowered immune system. And then do you take, do you, do you do the preventative care measures that are necessary? Probably not. You don't have time. Or if you're suffering from depression, you just don't feel like it. So two thirds of caretakers don't fill prescriptions at all. And another wow. third of them don't go to the doctor preventative care visits either. We also want to note that wage directly correlates with the amount of caregiving you're doing. The less money you make, the more unpaid care you typically do. I don't know if y'all noticed on the last slide, women are doing about $148 billion a year of unpaid, unpaid care. So mm. all of that time and effort just completely goes unrewarded because you're getting sicker, faster, and you can't take care of yourself. <laughs> You know, um, Corinne, I remember my my mom has passed away now, but um, I remember when she was before we had to actually put her like into a nursing home because she had gotten so sick she couldn't live by herself. 
I remember um, her doctor asking me, well, can't you just stay home with her <laughs> and take care of her? I'm You're like, like uh, are no. you going to pay my bill? Right. Are you going to pay my mortgage? Because if you were going to do yeah. that, then maybe we can talk. But but the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that up is because it really just um, speaks to the, that expectation that mm-hmm. we as a society have placed on women, you know, you, you should just leave your job and, and do this. And it was just like, can't you do this? <laughs> no, I can't. I have a, you know, I have a family to take care for. Um, you know, we're all public health advocates here in the audience. Um, why should this matter to us? Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, as we kind of already saw with the pandemic, when poverty and a public health crisis meet, we create a disaster, right? So we're looking at over the course of a lifetime, you talked already about like how much wages women lose in the millions, right? Over the course of a lifetime. But another layer to that is just taking time off for caregiving takes another $40,000 out of their pocket. And then it takes another 300 plus thousand dollars out of their pocket in retirement income. Not to mention women retire earlier typically to take care of family members. And then they live longer on top of that. So it just kind of puts them down in the hole a little bit farther. Poverty in and of itself creates health issues. You have lack of access, lack of afford, like you can't afford the health care that you want. Mm-hmm. You don't have access to the health care that you want. Women who are 65 and older and are of color are 70% more likely to live in poverty. That's your most vulnerable population. I'm over 65. I'm a woman of color. And then you add on chronic conditions that I probably already have because I never got the preventative care. Then you add on this acute illness possibility of COVID and you've created a huge crisis. And yeah. you know, to prevent that, we probably should close the wage gap so we don't go down this road again that we already saw with the pandemic. We already know it's coming. So we could right. now we know how to prevent it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And it just also speaks to the mm-hmm. fact that when this happens, again, this affects all of us folks, because if people are chronically ill, they are in chronic need, and we have to, as a whole, take care of them. They can't, can really contribute to a healthy economy if they are not getting, women, if not get, getting paid as much, or if they are sick, or if they are, um, um, just don't have the money because they've retired early and now caring for someone mm-hmm. else. It is truly a domino effect. So um, thank you, um, Corinne, for just kind of, you know, taking us through the weeds of how this really, really affects affect women on the individual level, but also on the macro level for all of us. So um, folks, as I said earlier, CHRNR is really investing a lot of time into the gender pay gap and the effects of it. We are learning so much as our or, um, as an organization, and we plan to share all of that with you. So there's definitely more to come from CHRNR on the gender pay gap. One thing that is in the pipeline is um, our In Solidarity podcast. Now, some of you have already um, checked out the podcast, and you know you've downloaded the first series, and now is subscribing to the podcast. Thank you so much. I want you to know that our second series that's going to be on the podcast is dedicated to the gender pay gap, and that will be released fairly soon. So you can listen to In Solidarity wherever you listen to your podcast. Be sure to get plugged in now, so that way when this second series drops, you'll be the first one to know about it. Now, this second second series about the gender pay gap is going to... Um, include National Economist Drs. Elise Gould, Jess Camilli, and Jessamyn Schaller. And we also have um, some CHR and our stars too, including Drs. Jonathan Heller and Elizabeth Blomberg, who is in the Q&A box with us right now, as well as Kirsten Frobaum. So you, we're, you're going to hear from some really, really, really um, smart people, more definitely smarter than I am when it comes to the gender pay gap about what this is and how you can address it. Um, And at the end of the day, we're looking for a solution so we can create a healthier um, uh, community.
So um, I hope you've enjoyed this discussion and we're just curious if you feel like you can adapt any of the strategies that you saw in the webinar. Don't forget, we talked about um, state strategies in terms of getting rid of, getting rid of those applications that ask for your pay history. We, as we talked about organizational strategies that you can use to raise, uh, to have pay equity or pay parity. So let us know about if you feel like this, any of these strategies could be adopted within your community. And you also saw the PSA that the YWCA uh, created. And Aaron is gonna launch, launch a poll and just let us know. Your responses are anonymous. So just tell us yes, no, or maybe. And then I want you to go back to the chat one more time, chat to Colleen, what challenges you think you would have in implementing any of these strategies? Because we just, you know, we're curious. We want to know and we learn from you all. So let us know. And Erin, you can go ahead and close that in five, four, three, two, one. You can go ahead and close that poll. So thank you. You don't have to share the results because these are all anonymous. So thank you so much for that. Um, at this point, I'm going to invite Joanne uh, to the mic. Let's see what kind of questions have been popping up, Joanne. Well, it's clear from the Q&A box activity that our presenters really got folks um, not only thinking about this strategy, but really motivated. Um, if you go back, Misty and Corinne, and look at the chat later after this live, you'll see people saying, that's so true. Thanks for laying that out. You made this so clear. So I think, you know, one takeaway for folks is going to be that um, they feel ready to make the case even even more strongly in their own community. So thank you. And I do have to give a shout out to Dr. Elizabeth Blomberg, who has been answering lots of very specific data questions in the Q&A box, which I cannot do, but she's clearing them out. So folks, if you posted a question that's very data related, make sure you um, catch your answer from, from Dr. Elizabeth there in the Q&A. But we do have some questions for our presenters, Erica. And I'm going to start off because um, it really caught somebody's attention when you mentioned the collaboration with your local United Way and really kind of starting. Um, so it wasn't just the why kind of out there in San Antonio trying to really address this um, this issue, but you partnered with another nonprofit. How did this effort inform their work? So it's clear, um, you know, everything that the YWCA is doing around the gender pay gap. What have you seen in terms of maybe continued partnership with your uh, United Way or things that they're doing that's complementary? Um, definitely the continued support, because as I said before, we were fortunate enough to have our local United Way not only support our efforts, but also uh, validate the need for uh, awareness and uh, continued support for the wage equity, I mean, to, to, to address the, um, the wage gap in our community. And so this wasn't a kind of a, a one and done type of thing. Um, you know, the partnership is there because our local United Way is behind it. They, they understand it, they support it, they wanna address it. And they understand that the YWCA San Antonio has been in the forefront and that we are going to address it. We're not going to shy away from the difficult, you know, the difficulties when you're talking about policy change, when you're talking about bringing about awareness, whenever you're talking about addressing, you know, potentially polarizing topics or triggering topics, you know, we do have our support from our local uh, United Way. And, um, you know, historically speaking, the YWCA has always been in the forefront of those very difficult uh, conversations and social injustices. And so uh, we are quite fortunate. Yeah, that's great. So um, opportunities for folks that do have a united way in their community to, to try to get them engaged and use yours as an example. So I love this question from Callie. And he says, as a male ally, what would be the most impactful small movements we can do to change the status quo of the gap? That is an excellent question, and I appreciate that question. Um, the first thing that you can do is you can be vocal, because whenever we're whenever we're looking for um, allyship, right, and we're looking for strong allies, 
that means that you are going to occupy spaces where marginalized voices are often not heard. And so you will, based solely on your gender, have an ability to validate the, the, the uh, wage inequities experienced by women and by women of color. And so um, speaking with your own um, HR department, understanding and learning about your own uh, um, wage uh wage practices or, 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 or um, you know, your hiring practices and advancements and our women being, you know, our women at tables where decisions are being made. And if you have that capacity to be a voice in areas where women's voices are either not heard or shut out or minimized, then I would um, encourage you to use the privilege that you have to be a voice, to encourage other men to be voices, to speak in arenas where, you know, we need those voices heard because we're talking and often no one's listening uh, for all the reasons that we outlined. Yeah. But uh, yes, as you saw in the PSA and as we have laid out, male allies are extremely necessary. Um, and we can talk further and you please feel free to email me, um, you know, and we can discuss more about yeah. what that looks like, what allyship looks like. Sure. And definitely it's the topic. Um, if you all can join us for the post-webinar discussion group in a few minutes that we can unpack. So really appreciate, um, really appreciate that question. Um, okay. So this is a question kind of related to, we're hearing a lot about living wage. And so, um, someone in the audience wanted to better understand that when you all are presenting data about the gender pay gap, if that's taking into consideration living wage. Yes. And I don't know, Erica, if um, we, you know, with the CHRNR data, if living wage is taken into consideration. Um, I do believe that is uh, for us is no so living wage is the the wage that you would need to make to be able to afford basic needs like rent um, or mortgage food transportation child care um, and and general health without having any type of government assistance you know so that's what that's what um, a living wage is generally if a woman's getting paid you know um, percents onto a dollar and what a male's making she's not making a living wage there are even even people even uh depending on what county you're in most people do not make a living wage in this country yeah. so that is factored in the data that was presented today that's good to know all right, one more question, and I'm actually going to invite Francesca Ritre, who is the CEO of the YWC San Antonio, to address this one, because, um, you know, I just want to remind the audience about Misty's title and Corinne's title. So Misty is Director of Racial Justice and Gender Equity, and Corinne is Director of Health Equity. And that just shows a really high level of commitment by the organization. So can you just speak briefly about how this happened and how other similar organizations like yours can follow suit? Great, yes, hi everyone. Um, the mission of the YWCA, which has been its mission for 150 years is to eliminate racism and empower women. And we were long leaning into this mission uh, to it, incorporate it into our, all of our programs, which locally we at YWCA San Antonio interpret to mean um, to remove barriers for women uh, to become, to break the cycle of poverty and become self-sufficient. So, um, We've been doing this work. We have been um, leading the way at, from an advocacy standpoint long before, um, before I hate to say it became trendy, but it's be, it's it more and more have come in, but that's a good thing. Um, equity should be at the core of everything we do. The everything all service or oriented organizations should do. So um, it require if you're a nonprofit, it requires an honest conversation with your board uh, governance committee to uh, be prepared to commit to that um, because there will be some followers and friends that you might lose along the way um, who are not ready to go on this journey. Um, it requires a staff commitment to have hard conversations, which uh, Misty has been leading and Corinne has been um, having her, her team do, and it's not easy. So it is committing to the, the hard work. 
Um, so, uh, but it is necessary to do and encourage everybody out there to do it. And thank you for serving it as, a, as an example for so many other communities. So I think, Erica, you're giving me my cue that that's all the time we have for no, Q&A. We, we actually have time for one okay. more question unless you, yeah, we can we do Great, okay, so we do have a question from Anna and she's just really motivated now after this webinar. And she asks, what are some suggestions on how to address the gender pay gap when your organization does not offer pay transparency and also asks employees not to shave, share their pay with colleagues. And then she had a sub question, how do benefits impact the pay gap or is that figured in into the gap? Um, I want to, Elizabeth, would Elizabeth be able to take this question? If not, I want to take it to the discussion group because I think this is a good one. Yeah, this is I a good question. I suggested that as well. Yeah. So, I'll wait and see if Elizabeth wants to take this to the discussion group. Um, Hi, sorry. I think that would be a great one for the discussion group. Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to break that down because that is actually a topic that comes up um, in our um, in our podcast. We actually have one of our researchers that go into that topic. So whoever asked that question, you're definitely going to want to listen to the podcast because <laughs> we actually go into depth about that. But um, but thank you, Joanne, for um, for getting us started with those questions. And and you know, I always tell folks, I always tell the production team, please do not get into the chat because if you get into the chat, you might miss your cue or something. I was in the chat. I was a bad girl. But let me tell you, the chat is off the chain, just like Joanne said. So Misty, Corinne, I am now giving you permission to look at the chat because it is amazing. I also want to um, give a huge shout out to South Carolina because someone placed in the chat that South Carolina recently passed a parental leave bill that um, Governor McMaster signed into law. So huge shout out to South Carolina for doing that. Um, folks, let us know uh, what you thought about this webinar. We love your feedback. Um, I'm asking Colleen to chat out a link to um, a survey. And if you would take the time to complete that survey, because we, the reason why we bring um, these topics to you is based on what we hear um, that you uh, feel is important to you. So make sure you fill out that survey. We actually do listen to your feedback. And speaking of listening to your feedback, I want you to mark your calendars now for October and November, because we're gonna present a two-part series called Rule America's Opportunity for Equity. And these two webinars are gonna be unlike any other we have ever done, all this based on your feedback. So each one of these webinars are gonna present strategies to advance equity in rural areas. So if you're a member of a health department, um, municipal county government, member of a partnership, I want you to not only be here, but to invite your partners. And I want you to kind of be in the same room with them because each one of these webinars are gonna be like a workshop of strategies. So we're gonna be workshopping things as a group. And they respond, these webinars are responding directly to the calls for support that we've been hearing from the audience. We need support when it comes to promoting equity and justice in rural areas. So we're gonna do that starting in October. First, we're gonna hear, we've heard from you that messaging equity and justice is, you know, to decision making policymakers can be challenging. Therefore in October, we're gonna feature Frameworks Institute. Now, I don't know if you heard of them, but trust me, they are a powerhouse international organization that focuses on framing messages for the good. So Dr. Andrew Volmer will be here to share new research that's gonna support you in framing the benefit of equity for communities. You don't wanna miss this. And then in November, we're gonna workshop, how do you leverage all the assets that you find in small town America? How do you leverage those assets for equity? And you're gonna hear from Chris Estes with the Aspen Institute, another powerhouse organization. And Chris is gonna introduce us to a new tool called the Thrive Rural Framework that will help you focus on what bridges rural communities rather than divide them. 
I'm telling you, this is going to be great. So we'll be adding a few other guests to this panel. These are those who have committed thus far. And registration for these webinars will be released soon. But don't forget to mark your calendars. That's October 18th and November 15th. And also, if you're coming to APHA this year, make sure you stop by the County Health Rankings and Roadmaps booth. I want to meet you. So we will be there in Boston on November 6th through the 9th. Be sure to stop and see us. And don't forget about that discussion group because we're going to head over there now and really unpack this, folks. We're going to really just get in there, get our um, hands and feet really deep into this discussion. Colleen's chatting out a link for that right now. Um, Joanne is probably headed over right now. So please join us um, in the discussion group so we can talk more about the gender pay gap. And also be sure to stay in touch with us through social media and by subscribing to our newsletter. So thank you so much for everything that you do to create equity in your communities. And thank you to our stellar guests, Misty Hardy and Corinne Reyes for sharing their wisdom with us today. I will see you next month. Thank you.